Okay, hi. Um, it's been a little bit um, since I've made a video, but let's just jump right back into it and talk about the books I read in September. I'm going to actually talk about one book I read in August because over the past few months, I honestly haven't been reading that much um, as I've been moving, which I mentioned in a previous video, and I've been... Um, painting and like doing very minor renovations on my house. Uh, I just really haven't had much time for it. Um, and honestly, a lot of the books I read in August aren't really worth your time. So I'm just not even going to waste my breath and talk about them. Uh, so let's just get into it. So the first book um, I'm going to talk about is the only one I read in August, and that is Dis Disoriental by Negar Javadi. This is translated from the French. Um, this is an interesting one. It has a very, uh, I would say, unique structure. And um, it's essentially this woman is sitting in a waiting room at a fertility clinic. She is like, the process is taking a really long time. And as she's sitting there, she is reminiscing back on her life. So you have moments in the waiting room and then you have time jump moments where she starts reminiscing on the past. Uh, sometimes where you're kind of, you're very much immersed in the, in the story and it's kind of like you're, you're reading it as it's happening. And other times where there's some sort of commentary that she's making as she kind of like comes out of her thoughts, I guess. Um, so um, her life, I guess, we could talk about a bit. So she grew up in Iran. Um, she grew up in a house where both of her parents were intellectuals. Um, and they eventually flee Iran and go to Paris. Um, and you get to meet her, uh, kind of her ancestors, her grandmother, like the, the life that led up to her parents and the life that led up to her. And then her life as she's kind of going through it. So... This is one of those books that stylistically, structurally, I really did not enjoy. Um, I would have DNF'd it if I wasn't so interested in what was actually happening. Um, I don't think that many other people would have this sort of response that I had, but I honestly found that reminiscent style very jarring because you are at that appointment the entire book. So she, in present day, you don't get more than a day of time. You don't get more than a few hours of time. But she, you're going back, and then you're going forward, and then you're going back into a different space of time, and then forward, and then in, into time. And so it's, it's like a very, um, at the beginning, it was a, a bit jarring, um, especially to find out where you were and what was happening. I was originally listening to it on audio and was getting a little confused, so went to a physical book. And once I kind of got into the swing of it, then I went back to the audio book. Uh, but I do see a lot of people really liking this. I It was a story um, or a perspective I hadn't really read from before. So um, as much as of a mix kind of response I had to the book, I think I would still recommend it if you have interest in it. It also, I forgot to mention, also takes place during the Iranian Revolution, um, a, a point in time that I did not uh, know as much about for um, maybe how, how uh, I don't know if this is the right word, I guess, but how liberal things were at the time, how um, um, religious ideology wasn't used as a form of submission for a period of time, and then um, kind of what came after that, which we can see presently, um, and is also kind of talked about within the space of the novel. It also, um, I believe, was a bit autobiographical. It read that way, and if you read the back excerpt about um, the author, um, a lot of things that happen in her life kind of parallels um, what happened to the protagonist of the book. Okay, so now let's get into the next one. Uh, Palimpsest by Catherine V. Valenti. Catherine M. Valenti, just kidding. Okay, another, <laughs> another interesting one. Um, this is, okay, Catherine M. Valenti, I hear a lot of qualms with her writing style, which I actually find a bit interesting because there's something about the way that she conveys a story 
that feels maybe like fairy tale esque and reminds me a lot of um, uh, the the way not the Wayfarer series, um, the Wayward the Wayward Children series by Sean and McGuire, uh, except dark a lot darker. Um, there is darkness in the Wayward Children series, but Pal Palimpsest and Catherine M. Valenti works that I've read have been much darker in tone. But to me, the writing is very similar. So it's really interesting that I have seen like people immediately DNF uh, Valenti for her writing style. Uh, I would say that if you're not enjoying it at the beginning, don't keep pushing along. But let's get into a little bit of what the plot is about. It's a portal fantasy in the way that you get to the locale, <laughs> the, the portal place, is by having sex with someone who has um, coordinates to that portal place on their body, and you end up in the place of their coordinates. So people find each other who have these coordinates on their bodies, maybe looking for different coordinates, trying to find different places, or maybe just trying to get back to that place. So when someone who does not have the portal fantasy on their body um, has sex with someone who does, then that's the first time that they enter. And people enter in groups of four. So you follow four people as they um, enter into this place together. Um, from different places around the world, and they are connected within Palimpsest. And you follow each of their stories as they are making their way in and out of this place, and eventually you get to some sort of connection between the stories. There wasn't much of, of a driving plot. It kind of just, like, moved forward it, it wasn't short stories connected, but it had that sort of vibe where you didn't have this overarching plot feel for most of it. And a lot of the chapters started off with a lot of description. It would bring you to a new place within the city. You get all of this description, you get all of this background, and then you would kind of have your character transported there. So something about that kind of structure became a bit tedious after a while. Um, but it was really weird and uh, unlike anything I had ever read before, especially when it comes to portal fantasies. Um, so uh, yeah, not sure if I would recommend. It's also really dark. It, I don't think it's it's a book for many readers, but there was a lot to kind of like sit there and think about as you're reading. Um, and the concept was very cool. Um, the application of the concept, I think, didn't work as well for me personally, just because of the lack of driving force. Like if you don't have maybe like a fully fledged overarching plot that drives the narrative forward, then for me personally, you need to shorten your book a bit. So I'm still like hitting the intrigue level. I think that it she could have made the book a bit more succinct, taken out some scenes and still kind of achieved the goal. And then uh, this should not come as a surprise. But there's a ton of sex on the page. So just keep that in mind. Next book I read was The Black Tides of Heaven by Neon Yang. So this is the first book in the Tensorit series, and I believe they're kind of like loosely connected, a loosely connected quartet. It was fairly short, um, and it follows these twins who are the children of the ruler in this fantasy setting, and um, their one of their lives was uh, given away to the Oh, the temple, the monastery, I, I can't think of what term was used in, within this book. Um, but then they end up having twins, and so um, both were given away. And you know that the ruler is this woman who's not really that great. Um, and it kind of follows their story at, through their lives. You see them age. You get It's a short book, and you get quite a number of age jumps. So you kind of just see specific moments in their life when they're together and maybe when they're apart. Um, and uh, you get to see bits and pieces of the magic system, the political intrigue. Uh, as far as uh, short stories go for fantasy, I thought that the world building was pretty good. Um, it, it was 
pretty immersive. You got to see a lot while still having intrigue and desire to read further into the books. Uh, the idea of gender was um, uh, quite different than how uh, gender is uh, seen and perceived in our universe. So everyone starts out um, using they, them pronouns, and when they kind of come to, of age, they uh, choose um, what feels right to them and uh, take on different pronouns and then have their uh, body modified in some capacity to fit what feels right for them. Um, yeah, the magic was interesting, though not super described. I mean, it's a very short book, so you're really only getting a little bit. I thought there was enough intrigue for me to keep reading the series, though I don't have a strong desire to move forward. Um, there's also something like a bit more literary about it in terms of fantasy. There's a lot more like a social commentary, I would, I would say. Uh, but overall, it was a solid read. Okay, next one I read is Mars by Aja Bakik. This is translated from the Bosnian. Uh, this is a short story collection. I did it as a buddy read with Olivia at Biblioghoul. Um, this is weird fiction. So <laughs> I, I, I feel like I read, I don't read a ton of weird fiction, but I read a decent amount. Um, and in my head, I like weird fiction. Like, in my head, I'm convinced that I like weird fiction. And I think the short story is a really good launching point for weird fiction because it was it, it's kind of like what I was talking about with Palimpsest. Like, you need, um, you don't want it to be too long um, or else, like, when it's weird and, like, there's not much of a plot because you, you kind of lose lose interest at a certain point. Like, you have to have something that keeps the intrigue other than the weirdness. So for me, a short story collection is a really great place for that. However, um, none of the short stories uh, really were that memorable. There were some that were a bit more interesting than the others. There was some commentary that I liked. Um, but then there were some things that I read in this uh, that... I found a bit uncomfortable and like underwhelming in terms of one one of the plot twists in one of them being that the white people from Europe were um, refugees to Africa instead of the reversal. It just there was just a few things, a few lines that were here and there in the book set. Mm, felt uncomfortable, I guess, and it wasn't that memorable. So I personally wouldn't really recommend the, these short stories. Um, I didn't really think that they stood up even against some of the weird fiction I have read. Okay, and then um, the next one I read, because there was like so much hype around it, and I was like, I have to know for myself. So I read um, I'm Glad My Mom Died by Jeanette McCurdy. This is a celebrity memoir. Um, Jeanette McCurdy was, I think, most famous on iCarly and maybe Victorious after that. I don't, I don't remember. No, maybe it wasn't Victorious. I'm not sure. I, I was like in the age demographic where I watched iCarly on Nickelodeon as it was happening. Like I knew who she was. So the book is very vulnerable. She is very upfront with the struggles she went through, the struggles she had with her mother. She didn't really hold anything back like you see in other celebrity memoirs. That's actually one thing that I find a little frustrating about celebrity memoirs. Um, there's a lot of triggering content. She dealt with a lot um, in her childhood. Uh, a lot of things that were um, outwardly abusive and um, obviously abusive and then things that are less so. Um, and then for a lot of the books, she does talk about her struggle with eating disorders and really describes, like, is, is heavily descriptive on what that felt like, what she did. Um, so, yeah, I, I would, um, I think that I would caution people who um, are dealing with eating disorders or uh, maybe have had one in the past. Uh, with this book just because um, there she, she's very descriptive about the way it made her felt. Um, 
or the way it made her feel. Uh, but overall, um, I really liked the book. I liked the, the short format of each of the chapters. They were really to the point, um, but was like still progressing a sort of kind of narrative of her life forward. Um, and uh, I really love that she talks about like her childhood, her growing up, and then like her her kind of um, finally, like, kind of hitting the wall of, like, the traumas becoming too much of her, her falling into her eating disorders and, um, like, alcohol dependency and, uh, like, the coming out of it and how, like, that took so long. And I think that it's just, uh, I guess, important for people to, um, kind of acknowledge. It, it's strange because, um, there's so much TV. This is not really in the book, um, but, it's it's interesting to think about like kind of the landscape of things because it's like she just even the things about like how she describes like being on set and having to go on to school on set and having no semblance of a normal childhood and not really having like much of a choice in the matter um on how she lived her life and like how truly um <laughs> different it is um from you know grow having a normal childhood growing up normally and then becoming an actor as an adult um and making an active decision and living that life as an adult as opposed to living that life as a child and if you think about all of the media that is made for children that have to have child actors in it uh it's just it it, it kind of like opens up the door to those types of thought processes while still being very like transparent to the types of things that she went through. So I thought it was really great. Um, I do really recommend, I always kind of get ner like, kind of like when I see a book getting a lot of hype, I'm always kind of like, mm, but this one felt well-deserved. And then uh, we'll talk very briefly. I read Royal Assassin, which is the second book in the Farseer trilogy. Uh, you keep your on your journey with uh, Fitz Chivalry, um, the bastard son to uh, Prince Chivalry. Ah, oh, man, I'm reading this with Mariana at Mariana Mass Books. I'm just really, I, I'm quite a bit into the third book at this point, but uh, I'm not going to say too much. I just really enjoy the series. Um, it's such like a slow-paced fantasy. It's very... Um, very, very character focused. I think that whenever people say like, I don't read fantasy, I read literary fiction or like have these like qualms with genres. I, I, I got really frustrated by this idea that you can like fit books into a box based on the genre that they're sold under because something like the Farseer trilogy is substantially different from uh like Mistborn which is super action packed like this has like quick moments but there's so much about the the relationships built and um watching Fitz grow up and uh like learn about the world around him and uh there's something very uh nostalgic about being in like uh the perspective of someone aging you you start the books I think when he's like six years old and in the second book I would think he would get to the age of like 18 in that like he spends most of that one as like a teenager um just kind of getting to see his thought processes I think that it does a really good job of like you as a an adult reader knowing things that Fitz isn't picking up on while still being in his first person perspective. Um, I think that's a very difficult thing to achieve. So if for people who like fast paced fantasy, this isn't necessarily the book series I think for, for you. Um, but I, I do think that this is a really great crossover series for people who like more about like characters and relationships and like slow paced books. Like I think that non-fantasy readers would like this series. And then the next book I read was La Bastarda. This is, ooh, what is this translated from? I believe the Spanish um, and the author is from Equatorial Guinea. I read this in a day. There, there's a lot that goes on in a little span of time and none of it is really explored that deeply. So you have this, your protagonist who is uh, maybe like 17. Um, and she's aging and there's expectations put on her by her family, by the culture she is a part of. 
but um, and and that part of that is to become a good wife, but she has really no interest in being a wife. Um, and uh, this is like a queer narrative. And uh, she has this uh, uncle who is uh, seen as um, undesirable because he doesn't do his duties because he is not married. Um, because he is a gay man, um, but that's not really something talked about in society. It's a uh, kind of a very quick story about the um, pressures that society puts on you. Um, but yeah, I think that it was like good, um, but it didn't really explore any of those concepts very deeply. Um, and the resolution kind of happened a little too easily for me. So it was fine, but I don't know if I would like outwardly recommend it unless like you're trying to read, you know, from around the world and you wanted a book from Equatorial Guinea. Um, I think that the reason I put this on my TBR was when I was trying to keep up with the Invisible Cities project, Equatorial Guinea came up and I kept seeing this one. I think this is the first book by a woman published out of Equatorial Guinea and it is actually, I believe, banned in Equatorial Guinea. Okay, <laughs> the next book I read, another one I have really mixed feelings about is The Sparrow. This is a alien first contact book. Um, it is very character focused and character driven. So this is kind of like a dual timeline um, story where you're following um, the before and after of the event. Um, and in the before, you're kind of building up to it, and the after is kind of like when you're hearing everything come out. So this is a first contact with Alien book, and I haven't read a lot of these, and uh, I, okay. It's interesting to read and then be, like, be aware of when your morals come into your reading of a novel. So, I have read books where alien contact is something that already happened in the past, and um, then, like, you know, there's, like, the alien invasion type books. First contact where humans choose to be the ones to go to the alien place and make contact is, I think, a hard sell for me if we as humans actually had this happen, where we actually had a sort of contact or an acknowledgement that an alien species existed. And then we chose to send out an expedition to that place. Um, there's something about that that is just colonizer vibes. Um, I, and I think that this book itself kind of echoes some of the colonizer vibes. Um, it is a Jesuit, um, party that ends up going to space. It is a, um, it's a mission that people aren't, I don't think, it's not really disclosed that much to the public that it's happening. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. Like, it, it just, it just makes me think back to the fact that, um, living in America, we live on stolen land. Um, there is the interactions with indigenous peoples in the past and presently that, um, is horrible. Um, and then there's like the, the, the active decisions and the consequences of those. And then there's the passive ones as well, um, where it's like you um, brought your favorite plant and then your plant becomes an invasive species and takes over and chokes out an indigenous population of plant species uh, and, and truly can just change the landscape of a place. Uh, I live in the Northeast and knowing how many of these species of plants that you actually have around you that are native to the area, it, it's pretty low. Um, and so the landscape of the place that you live in can be drastically changed by colonization. And it's, that's just like one very small facet, but it's just one of those things I was thinking about as I was reading where I'm like, I have qualms with this idea even being present and I was being challenged by that as I was reading and it was at times challenging my enjoyment of the novel. So 
<laughs> Let's actually just talk about the book a little bit. You're following a Jesuit priest who, um, uh, he is really good with languages, and he, it's very character-driven and relationship-focused, so he befriends this older married couple who, one's an anthropologist and one is a scientist, an engineer, I think he's an engineer. Uh, you have other people that they befriend through time and space, uh, pe people who all have very um, unique talents and it kind of brings those people together. So you see him, um, Emilio, in the past, and then you see him in present day, and you know he's the, um, the lone returner from this expedition, and he has been through intense traumas. I think that for people who really like character work then care in relationships, you might really like this. Now, it's interesting that I just talked about Robin Hobb and that being very relationship-focused in the Farseer trilogy and was really into it, but here, I feel that, so, so it's kind of like a, a lot of this book is a contained group of people, and um, some of the people are really focused on and their relationships are really focused on and others are very much forgotten. Um, it almost felt like you could have just cut those people out. I don't understand the motive in adding characters when substantial time was not given to their character creation, essentially. You also have the, the actual structure of the book. So you have this secret, <laughs> this thing that no one knows happened that's going to kind of explain how Emilio is currently and you are watching the lead up to that thing. And then you actually get to it. It felt very lackluster to me. There was this building and building and building of pieces and then everything kind of like happens very quickly where all of the things that happen individually should have had an emotional impact, but there wasn't one because it happened so in such quick succession that you're not even, none of the characters take the time to discuss or to grieve it or to kind of feel it at all. So as a reader, I wasn't really able to feel it. Um, this is also one of those books that everyone loves because it's very heart-wrenching. And when a book moves me to tears or moves me to feeling, I always end up liking it more because it's the, it's the written word able to get an emotion out of you. Um, this one, it's for me personally, it felt very manipulative. Like I knew it was trying to get me to cry. Um, and I don't like when I can actually feel the author's touch. I want it to be like this invisible act where um, you, like it feels like I was brought to tears on my own accord as opposed to the author like forcing me into that place. Um, and so I don't know, I'm so conflicted because I read the whole thing and I considered DNFing it early on. And I think that like, I, I, that parts of me are like, I'm like, yeah, I enjoyed it as much as I thought I was. So I wish I would have just DNF'd it. But other parts of me like think about all of the, the, the thoughts I've had around the book and the conflicted feelings I had even reading it. And there was something really that I really appreciated about that experience. And I do think that a, this book is for a lot of readers. I don't think a lot of people will have the kind of um, relationship with it that I did, but I wasn't, I just wasn't that big of a fan of it. Like it was okay. I think I'm more kind of like worked up about it because um, I thought I was gonna really love it and I've had it on my TBR for years. And so I felt just a lot more disappointment around not really liking it as much as I thought I would. Okay, moving on to the last book, and that is The Paying Guests by Sarah Waters. I really love Sarah Waters. I've read Affinity, I've read Tipping the Velvet, I've read Fingersmith, and this is my fourth book by her, The Paying Guests. This one has um, pretty low ratings on on Goodreads. I think I can understand why, but I just don't feel that way personally. So the book, like Sarah Waters, typically it's broken up into different parts. There are three parts. The first part is very long. Um, the second part is very short and the third part is again longer. So in the first part, you're introduced to Francis, 
who lived with her mother in a crumbling estate in the 1920s. She's lost her brothers to war, and she has also lost her father, so it's just the two of them. They don't have a lot of money, but they, it is a wealth. They, they come from wealth. So they choose to take in people to live with them, boarders, essentially, that are the paying guests. And uh, it is a younger couple that Francis ends up kind of becoming friends and interacting with them as they're living in the house. And the first part, like a lot of the books I've talked about here today, very focused on character building. There is like no plot to be seen in part one. And for some people, you're not going to like that. But for me, I just love following the characters. I love seeing the character progression. I think that Sarah Waters just can write really anything I'm going to enjoy. Her writing is really beautiful. She has a way of really making you like feel the characters and understand the characters. Um, and there's, even though there's not much of a plot, she's able to create just this underlying tension uh, that makes you want to keep reading. And then part two happens, and that's when you start to get plot. So I would say that if you're enjoying part one, you're probably going to like the plot of part two and three. But if you don't really enjoy part one, you're not really enjoying the characters, then you're not going to really care about what happens in part two and part three. I love like the sensationalist nature of Sarah Waters books. Um, this is what my preferred format of hers. She kind of has two formats that I have read. One where the parts feel like thematically connected and you don't have this huge jump in what's occurring. So it's kind of hard to describe without actually like spoiling the books. But there, there are Sarah Waters books where you have part one and then you go into part two and it's kind of like, okay, the location changed, um, the characters changed, the plot changed, and you really have to make like a shift to be like, okay, I'm now reading about completely new things. And you have to really care about what's going on enough to be able to like create that jump. So there's almost something like kind of jerky about the reading experience. Those are her books I prefer a little bit less. This is one of her books where there are new things happening in each of the parts, but there's like a like a cons there's there's a something that still keeps the a connection between the parts. Um, be it the location, um, be it the characters you're interacting with, there's just something that keeps it more uniform. So I really enjoyed the book. Can't really say much about it without giving spoilers away. I read this with Gina at Gina Stainer Books. It is our third buddy read, and we finally had a successful one. We have not liked the other two books we read together, so that was um, pleasant in and of itself especially because we both enjoyed the read. Um, but those are all the books I read in September. Hopefully I will have more consistent content coming out. And that is all I got. So until next time, happy reading.